How's everybody doing? Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so Pastor Dustin is on vacation. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hayden's bringing the word, so you got to deal with him. But this all makes sense shortly, this free throw line up here. Um, July 17th, we're going to go to the creek again. We're going to have creek baptism. If you want to be baptized, come see Shana, Tara, just, you know, those two, because, yeah. Exactly. Uh, the church will provide the meat, so please bring sides, desserts, and drinks. Teen camp is July 25th to the 29th. You can still sign up. And if, seeing real this wrong, if money is an option, it's not. Okay? There's people here that's willing to sponsor kids that want to help out. They can't make it, and they want to sponsor kids. So if, if, if money is holding, holding you back or holding one of your kids back, don't let it. Uh, you're not going to get a shirt, but you can still go, and it's going to be awesome. You can go right up to the day. It doesn't matter. And is that all we got? All right, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship. Have a seat. I really should look through the song list before the days I'm going to preach because I've lost my voice. What did you think of the second song? I don't know if you guys know. It's the first time we've done it. This, uh, what's it called? I Believe? I Believe. Yeah, yeah, it is. A pretty good song, yeah. It's got a pretty good message in there, doesn't it? Uh, I'm so glad you guys are here. I'm the associate pastor, uh, Hayden Dennis, and uh, Pastor D is on vacation this week. We typically keep that quiet. That way I've got a few people to preach to. Um, when you tell people that the, the pastor's going to be gone, that's a good weekend to skip, right? So we never, uh, we, never, we never let that cat out of the bag until he's already gone. Uh, but he's at Life Church in Lebanon today. Uh, I know they're going to have a great day. They had to get up super early. It was funny watching them try to get out of the house. By the way, if you're new here, they live in our basement. But long story, they're about to get into their own home. Um, it's about done. But no, we're so glad you're here. Uh, I've got a message that uh, God laid on my heart three, four weeks ago in the middle of the night. And I woke up, I'm like, that is phenomenal, that will preach. And I didn't write it down, because I said, there's no way I'll forget this. Uh, The next morning, it was completely gone. And so for two weeks, every day I prayed, I'm like, just give me a little bit, and I know it'll come back. And it never did. Uh, I was driving to Jeff City for a conference at work, and about halfway up there, it hit me, and I'm taking notes going up 54 on my, I couldn't read them. And then, there's this cool thing on your phone, these notes, and you can talk into it, and it, like, takes it. So, I, I figured that out on the way up there, but, uh, but God laid this message back on my heart, and I got to thinking about it, and it, it's actually, it's come about over the last several weeks. Uh, just some of the stuff we have got to see. And I know everybody walked in here and looked at this and is wondering what is going on. Uh, Casey is just messed up. I'm surprised he's not sitting in the floor right there. Um, But you see these blue lines. That's the name of the message, a thin blue line. And so I need some bold people to step up to the thick line and face each other, however many will fit. It's very simple. You don't have to dance. You don't have to. And we can, we'll make room. Not that line. Not yet. So uh, Jay Lee did this in a prison. Those things are heavy, by the way. He did this in a prison with a group of what he called suits and prisoners. But he told me if, I, if you could pull it off in a church, he says, I think it could change a whole church. And I agreed with him wholeheartedly. I said, you're right, it could. So it's real simple, guys. I mean, super simple. I'm going to ask a simple question. If it pertains to you, step up to this line and just stay there. If the next one pertains, stay there. If not, back back up. So it's just back and forth. So who likes ice cream? All right. We got a couple that don't like ice cream. Now, don't, don't get so close, it's like uncomfortable. I mean, um, who likes chocolate ice cream? Like, that's her favorite. No? Okay, we lost a few. 
There's differences in people, huh? Who likes coconut cream pie? <laughs> Holy cow. Last time it was like Brooke. She was like, and like hers are the best. There's one in my fridge. Well, what's left of it? All right. Who likes summer? That's their favorite time of year, summer. Um, we got some in between. No, it's all in or all out, man. All in. Okay, who likes fall the best? Fall. This is fall time. Um, let's say the best. That way we'll have a, a gap here. Okay. Who likes springtime? Like, that's your favorite. Like fishing, the old spring, everything's rebirth. Uh, that's okay. Stay there. Stay there. I bet this gets rid of all of you. Who likes to exercise? I met the ones in there. I knew you'd walk back out. All right. So we got some people who like to exercise. You see, there's a difference in people, right? Yet they're all people. There's a difference. Let's get a little more serious. Who struggled with reading the Word of God? Some point in your life. Some point. The rest of these are at some point. The rest of these are has. So at one point in your life, who has struggled, who has struggled with jealousy? If you haven't, step back. If you have, stay there. Who has struggled with alcohol? Who has struggled with prayer? I'd have to step up there. I should have brought the blue line on up here. Let's see. Who has had a struggle with drugs sometime in their life? Hmm. Casey, you tried to leave last time. We know better. <laughs> Who's let entertainment get in the way of their walk with the Lord? Is anybody surprised so far at who's standing and who's not? Who's struggled with lust? Who has struggled with pride? Hmm. There's more stand there than I thought. Who struggled with honesty? Good. <laughs> Did you call him a liar? <laughs> Who has struggled liking somebody at church? Has. Any time in your past? I like you. I, I said everybody. If you, there's somebody in church you've had a struggle with, step up to the thin blue line. All right, good. Struggled with, stand up to the line, yeah? Is it the one standing across from you? No, I'm kidding, don't. If you've had a struggle with an addiction any time in your life, thin blue line. Hmm. Everybody step back to the big one one more time. I got one more question. Who's the child of the one true king? Who, saved by the blood of the lamb. I like it. They're all there. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Casey, if you want your chair, you can go get it. See, what I want you to think about, when he told that it couldn't be done at church, I wanted to move all the seats out and make you do exactly what Casey's doing, but I knew Pastor Dustin would watch this message, and he would never let me back up here. Um, but no, I want you to think about that. Is you, was there anybody surprised? You don't have to shake your head, but you were surprised that the people are standing at that thin line? Because I was. This come to me at a conference in Jeff City. Uh, the gentleman does a leadership all over, and he did this in a prison with a bunch of what he called suits and the prisoners, and they were opposite. But I want you to realize, no matter what you're going through, what you've been through, what you're going through, there's somebody in this building that's been there, is there, has on the other side of it. But I want you to do that so you understand that everybody in this building has struggled. We all do. I've talked to people walking here, and like, everybody's so happy. They're not going through what I'm going through. Yeah, well, we are. We're only happy because we know Jesus. And we've gave our life over to him. But also what I want you to think about is you've seen people step up and step back. None of those things, none of those has, what I has known. That's real good, isn't it? I'll have to edit that out. None of those things that we've done in our life is what defines you. What defines you is that last question. Amen. When they were all standing on that blue line. Come on, Come on. See, I don't know when it started happening in the church. I don't know. 
I don't know when it started happening that we started letting past define us instead of our future define us through what we do. This message hit me hard. Uh, it hit me hard at camp. It hit me hard watching the kids at camp because there ain't nothing those kids will hold against you. When you're there and you're, you're just trying to minister to them, man, they're there, they're attentive. They don't care what you've been through, what you've done. Man, if you're pouring life into them, you're pouring life into them, and they love it. And so that's what got me thinking about this message. It got me rolling about trying to pull this off in a church. Uh, Jay Lee said he's going to watch this. I have to tag him in this because he said he'd, he's tried to do it in multiple churches, and everybody told him no. So I have to send him a video that shows him that we pulled it off. But I thank you guys for your honesty because that's what we have to be is honest. That's how we're going to grow as a church. That's how we're going to grow as a people is to be honest. But I want you to really think about as we're going through some stuff today that your past doesn't define you. I don't care what you are or what you've done. That's not what we're going to focus on in this church. Okay, we're going to focus on your fruits and let your fruits prove you. So going through this, so there's a couple of people in the Bible. I just picked a couple to talk about so I didn't run out of time. And then I'm going to bring it to some real-life situations that I've got to witness through this church. But if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We've got lots of Bibles. It's yours to keep. I'm going to jump around a lot. Not really a lot, but a lot in the same area. Because we're going to talk about David at first. So we'll be in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. And like I said, a lot of these scriptures I didn't put up on the uh, app because I am going to jump around quite a bit. But we're going to talk about David. Um... David would have to step up into that back, back and forth on that line a lot if you look through all the stories of David. And we're not even going to cover everything about David or as you probably know him as King David. We're going to start out as David. He was David before he was King David. Um, so we're going to talk about David. He was a shepherd boy, if you guys all remember that. He was the third king, and he was the most important king. So remember that as we're going through these stories about David. That he was the third king of Israel, and he was the most important king. The second most frequent mentioned human in the Bible. So think about that. Next to Jesus, David is mentioned the most. Uh, that, hit me, that hit me pretty hard to see that, that he's mentioned the most after we start talking about some of the stuff he did that didn't define him. But he was the second most mentioned he was from the tribe of Judah, and all the 12 tribes were named after, after the children of Jacob. There was 12 sons, and Judah was the dominant child. He was the number one. He prevailed over all his brothers. And so that was the tribe where David was from. And as he became king later on, he established Judah's authority. He, brought, he established Jerusalem back as the capital he made it God's headquarters. It was the main hub when David became king. He made all that the main hub. David's a pretty cool dude. I got to reading all these stories about him. And I'm like, I think I, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting him because he's pretty cool. He was Ruth and Boaz's great-grandson. So if you've been in the book of Ruth and read that story about love, he was a product of that story. He was the great-grandson of them. He was the youngest of seven brothers. Who knows that seven is a very important number in the Bible? You see it a lot. He was the youngest of seven. I don't think that was by accident. He was, he was from Bethlehem. So he was in pretty good company there, right? He was from Bethlehem. He, obviously, we talked about he was a shepherd. But as he was a shepherd for his father, he would kill bears and lions that would come take his sheep. Now, how cool is that? I've seen videos of my brother doing some crazy stuff, but I ain't seen that yet. <laughs> I'll say yet, because you never know. But in 1 Samuel 17, 34, you can turn there if you want. I'm just reading one, a couple of scriptures just talking about that. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when they came, a lion or a bear that took the lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. Man, how cool is that? That's what I mean. I don't want to meet this dude. He, he was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty mean dude to do that. But the thing is, you got to think about all that time he spent out in the field, all that quiet time he spent with the Lord. He learned humility. He learned confidence in the Lord because 
the Lord helped him through those situations. He didn't fight those bears and those lions alone, I promise. We, we would lose, right? He learned faithfulness and small stuff out there in the fields. I guarantee it. There's a, he was, I don't know if you've ever been out in the field very long by yourself. You have a lot of time to think. Uh, you deer hunters, you have a lot of time to think when you're sitting in a stand waiting for a deer to walk up. When I was a kid, we had lots of time because there wasn't no deer, it didn't seem like. So I had lots of time to think. But he had a lot of time to think in the field, and he learned a lot of faithfulness in God. And he learned how God could help him through those situations. David seems pretty cool. He seems pretty amazing to me. He was a musician. We definitely don't share that trait. I can't play nothing. But he would play music to soothe King Saul, which is the king that David takes over for. We'll talk about him a little bit later. But in 1 Samuel 16, 23, it talks about this. It says, whenever the harmful spirit of God was upon Saul, you need to read the rest of that because that sounds pretty bad. But David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. So a lyre basically is a guitar. I had to look this up. I didn't know what it was. So it was basically a, it was a musical instrument. It was wood. It was hollowed out. They put sheepskin over it, some strings. So the cavity made the, made the sound. So he basically was a pretty good guitar player. I mean, he's, he, when Saul was in a bad spot, King Saul, he would go and play for him. He would, he would just be able to calm his spirits, and you guys have probably heard, with a secret chord. But the guy was pretty good with his lyre. His duties at this time was taking care of his dad's sheep and playing music for the king. So he had a pretty good gig. He had peace and quiet, but then he got to go and minister to the king. He's got a claim for fame that probably the story, one of the stories we all think about the most, you can turn to 1 Samuel 17. Um, it's kind of known, right, for killing something pretty big. Remember David and Goliath? Probably his claim to fame is definitely this story. And think about it as we're reading it. Think about how awesome King David is. This is still when he's not King David yet. He's on that path to it. But in 2 Samuel 17, I'm going to read 23 and 24, and then I'm going to jump down to 43 and 46. But as he talked to them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, he came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke with the same words as before, and David heard him. And the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. So they were much afraid. He would come out, he would yell at them every day, and they would cower down until this little shepherd boy named David, right? So in verse 43, the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give you flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, who, have, who you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. I love that story. If David would have went and fought Goliath without the Lord, what would have happened? See, David learned... Back in those fields, fighting bears and fighting lions with the Lord, he could do anything, and he believed it. He was like those little kids at camp. When they said a prayer, they believed it, and God answered. He was the same way. He had so much time to talk with the Lord in the field. He had so much time to be, be with him that he understood that through God, nothing was impossible. See, these are the things that, that was defining King as he was coming up. This was defining David to get to that royalty, to get to the king, was those things that he did. See, when Goliath, back there in the first, when he cursed David and his gods, Goliath made a big mistake. Because when he not only cursed David, but cursed his gods, I guarantee it, God took that personal. And he was going to guide that stone right to his head. How's a little bit of stone going to kill a giant? Through God. That is it. That was it. So when he cursed David and his gods, he cursed God himself. I love that what it says, though, that 
You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come in the name of the Lord of hosts. Don't forget when you're in a battle where to go for your, for your strength and for your power. It's through him. This started off David's life as a great warrior. He killed Goliath, started out playing. The king already knew him. So in 1 Samuel 18, it talks about him being a great warrior, the things that define you in life. I mean, David was living them out to a T. Like, to a T, it was perfect. It says in 1 Samuel 18, 5, when David went out, he was successful wherever Saul sent him. This is in battle. So Saul set him over all the men of war, and this was good in the sight of the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So it didn't matter where he sent him. He had favor with the Lord, and he won every battle. So this guy was on a path to become the king, and he did become king after Saul. That died. Ooh, it's back. He became Israel's greatest king. Do not forget that. It says over and over and over in the Bible, he was the greatest king. As a king, he won so many battles. He's a king now. He went, still went in battles left and right. He made Israel a formidable nation. He made them who they were at the time. He expanded the territory. It got bigger and bigger because he was winning every battle he was at. He, the best thing he did, though, is he pointed his people towards God through the whole process. That's why he was the greatest king ever. But see this story, and you guys all know where I'm going. It has a but. On my paper, it says but with like one, two, six periods, like but. See, he'd done all these great things, but now we're in 2 Samuel 11, and something happens. I'll read this scripture. It happened late one afternoon. Remember, David's king. He arose, actually, it doesn't matter if he's king or not in this story. He arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, and he saw from the roof a beautiful woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent to inquire about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the son of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. She came to him, and they lay with her, and she returned to the house, and the woman conceived. And she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So here we got a king. He's had a phenomenal life, building his reputation. And then this happens, right? See, this is way before Matthew 5 where Jesus said, just to look upon a woman, you've committed adultery with her. It's way before that. But he clearly, clearly knew this was a relationship he could not go after. It was Uriah's wife, his number one soldier. It was, it was very close to him. I guarantee it, if you're leading armies, you're number one person, you're pretty tight with them. He knew this was not a relationship he could go after. Plus, David was very well versed in the Torah. And not only did Jesus say in Matthew that just to look upon a woman was you were creating or causing that with her, but in the Torah, for adultery, you could be uh, murdered. It was pretty serious. And he knew the Torah. He knew, he knew that adultery was punishable by death. But he still had that moment, right? He had that moment. Then what happens, right? He does what we all do. Now, these people up here are pretty honest, and maybe they did try to hide some of the things they didn't want you to know. I don't know. That's between them and God. But what do we do when we do something wrong? We start that trail to hide it, right? See, he'd done all these things to build himself up as a really good person, and all of a sudden there was this moment that I guarantee it he felt like it was all crashing down. Who's been in that moment where you feel like it's all crashing down? I've been there. I think we probably all have. I won't make you walk up the line, I promise. I promise. But we've all had those moments where it all comes crashing down. See, what he did to cover up his sin just gets worse and worse and worse. He brings Uriah home, right? To, he's like, all right, I, I, got to, I can figure this out. I'm going to bring him home. He'll go be with his wife. They'll think it's their child. 
We can keep her quiet. They'll figure it out. It'll be fine, all right? He brings Uriah home. What's he do? He doesn't even, like, he won't even see her. I think he's seen her, but he said he wouldn't lay with her because all his buddies were still at war, and he wasn't going to do that to them. Uriah sounds like a pretty stand-up guy. So that didn't work. So let's get him drunk and then try it again. No, nah, still didn't work. Uriah still did not lay with her. All right, he's trying to cover it up like we all do over and over instead of just fessing up. Last thing he does is probably the worst. I don't know if you can rate him in worse, but he sent him off to the front lines, the most dangerous battle there was, and then pulled his troops back so he'd be killed just to cover up a mess up. Basically a one-night mess up. He's killing somebody to cover it up. I hope in this room none of us have ever went to that length, but we've all went to length to cover stuff up. Guarantee it, we have. So how is he still known as the greatest king? I told you over and over, after this, it says he's the greatest king Israel ever had. It says in Scripture that he was a man after God's own heart. Does it sound like when we're telling the story about Bathsheba that he's a man after God's heart? No. But, but, that moment in time did not define him. Everything he did before, especially everything he did after, is what defines him. I'm so tired of the church holding something against somebody that Jesus has already forgiven. Amen. I'm tired of it. Just like this. King David had done all these great things. He messed up bad, and he's still a man after God's own heart. What we do in the future is what defines us, not what we've done in our past, not what we've done in one moment. You cannot let that define you. Do not let that hold you back from doing something you're supposed to do. That's what happens so often is we let it hold us back because we don't feel worthy. Listen, you ain't better than God. He forgave you. Don't let it define you. I'm going to talk about Saul of Tarsus. Hey, I'm in the New Testament today. Dustin come up last or this morning. He's like, you ready? I'm like, no, I'm not. He goes, hey, I've seen you in the New Testament. Congratulations. I'm like, mm -hmm. he actually said, good balance. Got both. I said, that's right. But I want to talk about Saul of Tarsus. Um, he was a young man, very, very well educated. He was on his way to becoming a rabbi. Uh, I would, just guessing, I would say he was a very arrogant person from the things I read about him. Uh, very smart. He was a very zealous man, is what it calls, of the Jewish faith. I had to look up zealous. I've heard it. I didn't know what it meant. Uh, it's basically just a very strong, a strong desire. So he had a very strong desire in the Jewish faith. We're, in Acts 7... Uh, we'll be reading a little bit out of there about Saul. Um, I do. I feel like Saul probably, I, you, we've all met people, right, that, that kind of fit that, that personality that Saul had, uh, kind of knew it all. Um, I'd say he was very bullheaded, very, uh, very in charge all the time. Listen to this story in Acts 7. Some of you might uh, recall this story. Um, now, when they heard these things, they were enraged. And this is the Sanhedrin that is enraged, just so you know. Um, and they ground their teeth at him. Have you ever been so mad you ground your teeth? Casey said, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> been there. They were so mad they were grinding their teeth. And this is Stephen. Listen to this. Before the Holy Spirit... He gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and rushed, rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their garments at the feet of this young man named Saul. So this is the stoning. This is the first martyr in the Bible, right? This is Stephen. I've never been mad enough where I was grinding my teeth that I remember. Maybe in a basketball game. I had some issues. 
Um, if you ever played against me, I'm sorry. I love you. Um, but I, I, I've never been that mad. But right here where it says that they rushed together at him, if you look back, that same word they used, the same word they translated out of there on that rush was the exact same word they used when Jesus cast out all the demons and they rushed into the pigs. So they were going after this guy full force to take him out. See, they stoned Stephen for nothing more than because he was preaching the good news of Jesus. And this Saul of Tarsus was there, and it said right there at that last, the last verse, the last sentence, it said they laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So laying down their garments, what that meant, it suggested that Saul was not just a bystander. He wasn't just there, part of the Sanhedrin, like, I'm just watching this happen. He was in charge. He was the one in charge. He was an official with the Sanhedrin. He was the one probably calling the shots, saying, do it. See, this Saul, not like King David, was not had a good reputation, and he was not setting himself up very well. He had a very, very hardened heart against the message of Jesus Christ because it totally went against the Judaism that he was very, very indoctrinated into. He was very sharp on Judaism, and the, the, the message of Jesus was very threatening to him. He sent, he's seen people like Stephen as a very, very big threat, obviously. See, he had him killed, but that wasn't all he did. In Acts 8, 3, listen to what it says Saul does. But Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women, and committed them to prison. Would we all be sitting here today if we knew Saul was coming in here to drag us to prison? I don't know. Is it going to get to that? I don't know. We've said several times back during the pandemic when we stopped for a week or two and everybody else was like, um, we're not going back, we're worried. And I looked at Dustin and I said, listen, they can only take one of us to jail, the other one will keep preaching. And we were the first church around here that said we was going to do it. And once the other churches heard that, we all went back on the same Sunday. It was awesome. Pastors got together, said, let's do it. But someday it may come to that. But look what Saul was doing. He was ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging Christians out. And I'm sure it wasn't pretty. It wasn't like, come on, let's go. I bet he was dragging them by their hair. I bet he was dragging them by their feet. He was a mean, mean dude, right? His past was defining him as a mean dude that nobody wants to be around. But there's another but in this story. He's on the road to Damascus, right? Leading prisoners to jail, on his way to persecute a lot more, and he runs into a man he didn't know. I love that in that one song we sung last week. I ran into a man I didn't know. He ran into Jesus on the road to Damascus, and it changed everything. Changed everything. He put scales over his eyes. You read the whole story. They came off a little later, and he flipped his life upside down and started spreading the good news of Jesus. He became one of the most influential apostles in the history of Christianity. The guy that was killing Christians became the most important at the time, and probably rightfully you could argue now still. Come on. Seriously? We tell somebody they can't be a deacon in a church because they had a divorce before they was married. He was killing Christians, and now he's the best pastor ever? Seriously. Where are we at as a Western church? Think about it. Paul goes on, he dedicates his whole life to the commission, writes 13 books of the Bible, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians, Philemon, Colossians, Philippians, 1st Timothy, Titus, 2nd Timothy. He went from killing Christians to writing the Bible. See, his past didn't define him. His future, his fruits is what defined him. I don't, I just, I, I watch things happen I watch people get held down because of something that happened, and I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. When you have a true experience with Jesus, the old is gone. The old is washed away. We wash it away sometimes in that creek. It ends up way down river. 
you can't even, that's why I love creek baptisms, because you can't find that water. It's gone. I love baptisms here, too. Don't feel bad. If you got baptized here, it's just as important. We dump that water. It's gone, too. But we drag up the past so often, and I, I'm, I, I hate to see it in the church. I hate to see it. I'm going to bring it to real life. I'm going to bring it to today. I got a picture. Throw that picture up there. What was your name? Tie-dyed. Tie-dyed what? Tie-dyed for Jesus. This is at kids' camp. This is KC Blair, Tommy Hines. So, uh, Casey's got 15 years behind bars right here. Tommy's got five years behind bars. I'm not going to talk about how long their addictions because I don't care. There's very, very few churches that they could go serve. Hardly any. I talked with my dad about this. And he's seen the pictures. And he said, there's not a church in this nation that would let those two go to kids camp. And I said, but their past don't define them. Guys, if you were there and seen what they did with these kids, you would realize that our past cannot define us. They were made for a time right now. You were made for a time right now in this place for a reason. Why do we let society say that Casey and Tommy can't go serve at kids camp? They had a background check. Your kids are safe, I promise. We have to do those things. But we can't let their past define what their future has proved. If you've been around them, you understand why we allowed that. If you were there, promise you'd understand why we allowed it. There was kids in their group that only they could talk to. There was kids in their group I could, I could relate with. But as a whole, they had to relate with them. They've been there. They've lived the life. They have grew up that way. They've had the same thoughts. You were made for a reason to witness to a certain person. It's so sad. Like I said a minute ago, I've got friends that are told they can never preach the Word of God. Even though the Bible clearly says we are all priests. If you're a born-again Christian, I hate to tell you this, you're a priest and you're supposed to be spreading the good news. It may not be up here. and That's perfectly fine. But I got friends that's been told they can't do it. Like I said before, I got a buddy that told he could never be a deacon in a church because of a divorce, previous divorce, before he's ever saved. The church has put so many rules, so many rules down that they wouldn't let David come on stage and play a secret chord. Right? Oh, we can't do that. You remember what we did with Bathsheba? We can't let him up there to play a secret chord for us. Probably the best musician ever. No. He slept with Bathsheba. We can't do that. See, the church would say that it's past defining him. We wouldn't let him up here. They wouldn't let Paul go and preach the good news right now. Guarantee it. He'd be in prison, right? He was killing people. We ain't going to let him go out on the road and preach the good news of Jesus. I have a feeling they wouldn't even let Jesus on the stage. You remember last time he was here? He flipped the tables? Spilled the coffee everywhere? A few of you got it. I got time. <laughs> Seriously, though, why do we do that? I don't, I don't understand why. You look in the Bible and the stories, it's everything they did afterward. After they had their encounter with God is when everything started rolling. You've got to use your past but we sure don't glorify our past. I hear some testimonies, and I kind of cringe a little at times. I'm like, are we making the bad stuff sound a little too good? I hear it. I've probably done it. But what Jesus has done for us is what was going to define us. And yes, we're going to build from those past experiences. We're going to learn from them. They were able to help some of these kids because of past stuff they had. Guarantee it. I did the blue line thing to show that we are all in the same boat. I don't care what you're struggling with in this place. I don't care where you've been or where you're headed. Somebody here has been there. We counsel people all the time. They feel like they're alone in this place, and they're, they're the only one in a struggle. And I laugh. I'm like, honey, you don't get it. We're all in a struggle. Every one of us. It may be a different struggle, 
But I did the blue line just to prove that where everybody was. Because sometimes when you're standing face to face with somebody, you're like, I never dreamed you would have had that problem. I'm hoping to change somebody's thoughts today about it. But what I really want you to understand is all those times they stepped up on all those things that they had done in their life, that don't define them. What defined them is when they walked up there and said, I am a true son and daughter of the one true king. And I'm here to serve. I'm here to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to reach more of the lost. I don't know what you're holding back in your life. I don't know, I don't know what you've got that you think defines you. But Jesus wants to get rid of that today. He wants it to be gone today. He wants you to wholeheartedly serve. Uh, we've got plenty of people for teen camp, but he wants you to serve. Everybody's like, hey, I want to work at teen camp. Uh, yeah, Tucker needs people on Wednesday nights. I don't know what's, what you think is holding you back, but don't let it hold you back. What God's forgiven, nobody can hold over your head. Amen. Let it make you who you are, because that's who you are, but don't glorify it. Don't glorify that old life. Glorify what Jesus did through that and out of that. Man, I love this church because we have so many people that just came out of the gates of hell. Plain and simple, they still remember what that fire feels like. And they bring that fire of the Holy Spirit here because he has released them from it. Like, I don't know what you're struggling with, but today is a day to get rid of it. We're going to go to a time of altar. Whatever, whatever you've got holding you back, come and pray about it. If you're sitting here listening to all this and you're like, I've never had that Damascus moment. I've never had that moment where I met that man on the road I didn't know. I want to tell you about him. We get to see so many salvations in this place, and I love it. I love it. But today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of letting go of that old past and living in your new freedom. Listen, it's, it's 4th of July weekend. I, I made a video last night sitting here studying. You know, this is the weekend for, for the freedom of our country. But right now, like, I'm, I'm very happy for that. But right now, I want you to have freedom in Christ. And live in it. Have joy in it. Tell people about it. That's what being a priest is all about, is just tell them what Jesus did for you. So we're going to play some music. If you need to talk, I'll be up front. The altar's yours.